Okay, let's um, let's begin. Um, well, can I welcome you to uh, this uh, roundtable event, um, which is a uh, roundtable uh, on uh, rethinking uh, post-communist regimes. Uh, it's organised jointly by the uh, uh, UCL School of Slavonic Studies Politics and Sociology Seminar Series and by our Ceasing Now uh, Public Engagement Series. Um, I'm delighted to welcome five very uh, distinguished um, speakers. Um, we have uh, Balant Mag Magyar Balant Madlovic, uh, who have come over from uh, Budapest and whose work we will be um, focusing on. Um, Cheryl Strohschein from the UCL uh, School of uh, Political Science, my colleague Alina Lidineva uh, from uh, UCL uh, CIS, and online from uh, George Washington University uh, in the United States, uh, Henry Hale. Um, I'll briefly. I'm Sean oh, not Leslie. I'm Sean Hanley. Um, I'm the chair. You can <laughs> you can Google me if you need to. Um, I'll briefly introduce um, our panelists in in more detail, and also the um, the topic um, topics that we'll be engaging with, uh, as it seems best to kind of do this um, in one go. Uh, so Balint Magyar uh, is a senior research fellow at the Central European University Democracy Institute. Um, published and edited numerous books on post-communist mafia states. And he was formerly uh, an activist in Hungary's anti-communist dissident movement and a founder of the Alliance of Free Democrats, uh, Hungary's, one of Hungary's key liberal parties, member of the Hungarian parliament and minister of education uh, in uh, two centre-left uh, governments. Um, Balint Mad Madlovic is junior research fellow at the uh, CEU Central European University Democracy Institute, uh, holds an MA in political science from CEU, uh, BA in economics and a BA in, in sociology. And he is, uh, and he and uh, Balint Magyar are author of a series of books, um, Mafia State, The Anatomy of Post-Communist Regimes, The Concise Field Guide to uh, Post-Communist Regimes, and most recently work on uh, Russia and Ukraine, um, which have really challenged the traditional comparative politics way of understanding regimes in the post-communist world in a quite wide-ranging and radical way. And that really will be the focus of our discussion um, today. Um, our um, discussants, uh, additional panelists, are Professor Henry Hale, who's uh, joining us online, He's Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at the Elliott School of George Washington University. Uh, he spent extensive time conducting fieldwork in uh, post-Soviet Eurasia, currently works on identity politics and political system change, and is the author, co-author of two prize-winning books, uh, most recently The Zelensky Effect with uh, Olga Onuk, uh, but also Patronal Politics, and this is a book which speaks to many of the same concerns uh, that the Balint and Balint have uh, engaged with. Um, Aljona Lejeneva, as I've mentioned, is Professor of Politics and Society here at UCL CIS, um, internationally renowned expert on uh, informal governance in Russia, but also um, beyond, uh, who researches corruption, informal economy, um, inf informality in corporate governance, networks, patron-client relationships, and she's author of a, tr a trilogy of books, um, Russia's Economy of Favours, uh, how Russia really works, can Russia modernize Sistema, and also heads up the Global Informality Project and the Global Inform Global Encyclopedia of uh, Informality. Three volumes. Three volumes, <laughs> okay. And last but not least, um, Cheryl Strohschein, reader in politics at the UCL uh, Department of Political Science, uh, holds a PhD from Columbia, uh, who works on the dynamics of ethnic and religious identity, especially interested in states where democracy is uh, eroding um, because of authoritarianism or patronal rule. Uh, it's published very extensively in journals like Perspective, Perspectives on Politics, Nations and Nationalism, Europe, Asia Studies. Um, she's author of um, two books, almost, or one that's... Well, one's edited. One's edited, okay. That's cheating. Okay. Um, <laughs> But Ethnic Struggle, Coexistence and Democratization, which is a very fine single author book. And you are currently working on a book on um... 
entrenchment. entrenchment of party control in ethnic enclaves in um, North Macedonia, uh, Serbia, Romania, and Slovakia, especially Hungarian, um, Hungarian. minorities. And also Albanians. Also Albanians. Okay. Yeah. And that appears, is that? Does oh, that have, goodness. Have a, it's still being written. Oh, it's still being written. Okay. <laughs> so watch this space. Um, right. So I think um, we'll begin, if I could ask um, Balint and Balint, if you'd like to talk about your work. And I think you're going to talk about really how it begins and then take us through the trajectory of um, what you've researched all the way through to your current book, which deals with Ukraine and Russia. So um, I need to give you the mic here. Do you, I think you might need to be both. Both is difficult. But OK, well, I think the big one is the main one. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, and for the attention uh, and uh, uh, what you uh, show towards our work is really. Uh, really an honor for us. Uh, so uh, in 2001, when the uh, Orban Victor's government, the Fidesz government uh, was in power first time, uh, I wrote an article uh, with the title uh, of uh, Hungarian Octopus, the Organized Upper World. And in this article, I made difference between three levels of uh, three levels of corruption: the petty corruption, the next level, the so-called oligarchic corruption, and the third level, the criminal state, uh, uh, when not oligarchs are capturing or criminal organizations are capturing the state, but the state is operated as a criminal organization capturing uh, uh, the state, the markets, and the oligarchs as well. And at that time, the article uh, was finished. Uh, with that idea that uh, uh, as the Orban government uh, uh, had no monopolistic power, namely uh, uh, they could not change their law as a single political force, the constitution and all those other laws. Therefore, it uh, meant a constraint for them. And still they had an autocratic attempt uh, to monopolize their power, but they could not reach the position through an autocratic uh, breakthrough, the uh, uh, consolidation part of the autocracy. Uh, at that time, they did not have two third majority in the parliament. And the elections at 2002, uh, the opposition parties, uh, the socialists and liberals, liberals to which I belong, uh, uh, get into power for two cycles, consequent cycles in the parliament. And then Orban Viktor, the government, uh, after the collapse of political, economic, and practical and moral collapse in Hungarian politics, uh, says the power, but not simply the power, but uh, uh, as a result of a disproportionate election system, uh, uh, with 53% of the votes, they seized uh, about 67% uh, of the seats in the parliament. Uh, so they uh, got in a monopolistic uh, position at that time in at that time in Hungary. That was the autocratic breakthrough. Uh, in 2013, uh, uh, <clears throat> I brought together a book about uh, Hungarian octopus, a post-communist mafia state, with this title about 22 authors, and then it was. Uh, uh, followed by two other such uh, works in the consequent years. And uh, uh, in 2018-19, uh, 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 with my young friend, uh, Balint Modlovic, uh, uh, we wrote uh, 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 a theoretical work uh, uh, trying to find a brand new language for the description of post-communist uh, post regimes. Of course, when I wrote my first article, he was not in the position to join me as an co-author as he just started the, his studies at the elementary school. <laughs> but uh, since that time he finished uh, and, and we are working, to, uh, working together. Uh, uh, so uh, <clears throat> after a decade, uh, uh, after the regime change, uh, uh, we uh, uh, had to give up the uh, mainstream notion of transitology, which had a kind of teleological character, which assumed that with the collapse of, uh, of uh, uh, communist regimes, uh, there will be uh, necessarily a 
uh, uh, even if difficult, but a uh, road towards liberal democracies and just only at the question that uh, how quickly this or that country will reach that level. Uh, but uh, uh, we found, and as everybody, that most of post-communist regimes uh, stuck uh, into a position between uh, liberal democracies and dictatorships. Uh, and the question was how to uh, characterize these regimes. And at that time, uh, everybody was thinking of different names for these hybrid regimes. Uh, maybe the uh, most generally used was uh, 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 that model which was set up by Horvath and Rössler, uh, just uh, making a difference within hybrid regimes, electoral democracy, competitive authoritarianism, hegemonic authoritarianism. In spite of this, uh, uh, with Balint, we preferred much more uh, that classification, which uh, made the difference between democracies, autocracies, and dictatorships. But the uh, mainstream politology uh, uh, at that time, and I think even now, uh, <clears throat> They are concentrating mainly on political institutions on one hand, and on the other hand, they use the language for describing the post-communist regimes, that language which is used for the description of, of liberal democracies. Uh, uh, so the problem for us that with that type of language, we think that uh, you cannot uh, explain all those uh, phenomena or uh, what you necessarily uh, witness in post-communist regimes. Uh, we feel somehow like that if you enter a zoo, you stand in front of an elephant and you say that it's an illiberal fish. Then of course you will know that it's why not a fish, but it does not say too much that what is this creature uh, itself. And therefore uh, 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 we had to think over that what are those hidden, sometimes unconscious axioms what the mainstream politology accepts. One is that, that the separation of spheres of social action uh, is completed, namely uh, the social, the spheres of uh, political sphere, the economic sphere and the communal sphere, uh, the relation between them uh, is transparent and formalized. The question is whether it is so, according to us not, and as we are going from west more and more towards the east, they are colluding with each other. And even in the communist regimes, they were completely merged, completely merged. And uh, uh, without just 100% accepting Huntington's idea, but if we make a difference between those former Soviet uh, uh, communist countries, which belong to the uh, Western Christianity, the others to the uh, Orthodox Christianity and the Muslim world, uh, uh, they show absolutely different ways of uh, trajectories of post-communist regimes. The second such axiom is that the daily position of persons and institutions necessarily coincide with their de facto positions. In a liberal democracy, it's, it's more or less so, but in a post-communist regime, not definitely. If we say, use the word entrepreneur, in a liberal democracy, of course, we assume, and it's right, that the entrepreneur uh, practically disposes of, uh, on his property uh, uh, as he or she wants. In a post-communist regime, when you say entrepreneur, you can never know whether he is the real owner of those assets which are uh, legally de jure on his name. In a lot of cases, no. They can be frontmen, stooges, oligarchs, etc., etc., where the real situation is absolutely different. Uh, the third is that uh, the axiom that the state is necessarily pursuing uh, public good. And what happens when not? This assumption which says that they necessarily pursue public good, it means that, uh, of course, uh, the, uh, the discussion between different political forces can be only about that, that whether the public policy is what they follow, which is better for the nation or worse for the nation, and this is the basis of their rivalry, or there are corrupt cases, etc. But what happens when definitely uh, the state pursues private interests? And if we open these axioms, then of course, we have to face that problem that uh, trying to position these countries uh, uh, on a single axis between dictatorship and, and democracy does not say too much about the real nature of these uh, regimes. So the question is that, uh, that uh, what can be uh, uh, that dimension uh, 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 and the feature 
the use of which uh, can really make a difference in the analysis. Uh, at this point, uh, uh, we lean on uh, heavily on the works of Henry Hale, patron of politics, also on the works of uh, Alana Ledeneva uh, concerning informality. And this special category is informality and a special form of informality, uh, uh, namely uh, a hierarchical informal relation, patronalism. And if we make a difference when we are speaking about regimes, that how can we characterize them, whether they are closer to a patronal regime than to a non-patronal, then the first dimension uh, is speaking about uh, whether the ruling institutions, where the decisions are made, are dominantly formal institutions or informal ones. If these are informal ones, then we can say that that regime is much more much more uh, uh, patronal, which means, for example, that such sentences in the case of patronal autocracies, I will speak about later, that uh, this or that party decided about something, or the government decided about this, the parliament decided about that. These statements has no sense at all, because the decisions are not made there. Of course, in a liberal democracy, in these formal institutions, decisions are made. But in Hungary, Russia, Central Asian post-Soviet republics, decisions are made in informal institutions, uh, uh, which can be called the ruling elite, uh, 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 and the operational body of it is uh, chief patron's court or something like that. Whether the regulations are normative or discretional ones. Discretional means that under the cover of, of uh, normative, in quotation mark, normative regulations. Practically, there are custom tailored laws and degrees, which on one side uh, reward certain uh, actors, enterprises, organizations, or try to punish them. Also, mainly whether they are discretional or not. The authorizations, uh, what, who is the actor who makes the decisions? These are collective or corporate bodies, dominantly, or just persons. Like in Hungary, there is a personal rule. Central Asian countries, a personal rule. In Russia, also one person decides most of the things. And the hierarchy in the society is characterized by bureaucratic institutional chains or clientelist personal chains. And if these are the dominant forms, then we can say that these countries are more and more patronal, patronal ones. It means at the same time, when we are speaking about corruption, we have to make a difference between at least six levels of corruption. And uh, we focused not on the petty corruption, which is a free market corruption, voluntarily, non-centralized, horizontal one, and competitive one, but much more on the corruption pattern of a criminal state, when the state itself and the governance itself is operated as a criminal organization. So in the case of Hungary, for example, you would say that Hungary has no government, but it has a criminal organization. And its behavior and acts can be described as actions of criminal organizations belonging to the uh, sphere of grand corruption, which is a coercive one, centralized one, monopolistic, uh, monopolistic one, and not occasional and partial relation in a corruption transaction where you can freely enter and freely exit from a corruption uh, relation, but they are permanent and general vessel type chains which are built out in such a, such a society. As a result of this, uh, 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 we came to the conclusion that we should give up uh, that type of uh, tip is, uh, uh, making types uh, and characterization of uh, post-communist regimes, we should position them on an axis between dictatorship and liberal democracy. But along the lines of patronalism, we should double these categories, which means that democracy could have also two basic types, liberal democracy and patronal democracy. Patronal democracy would mean such a situation where competing patron line networks None of them are enough strong to subjugate, to liquidate, to eliminate the other ones, to, have in a, to get in a monopolistic power. Uh, concerning autocracies, we make a difference between conservative bureaucratic autocracies and patronal autocracies. In the case of conservative autocracies, the power concentration 
is uh, tied mainly to the political sphere. But at the same time, you cannot witness a patronization of the society, subjugating the uh, sphere of uh, uh, economy, entrepreneurship, civic organizations, others. While in a patron autocracy, you have a, a patron client network, which got into a monopolistic situation in a, uh, uh, concerning, uh, concerning the political power. And at the same time, patronizes the economy, the civic, uh, civic sector of the society, uh, the media, et cetera, et cetera, these different layers of the society. While in the case of dictatorships, you know, a very simplified way, the communist dictatorship can be <coughs> described as the uh, one party system, combination of one party system with the monopoly of uh, dominance of state ownership, while a market exploiting dictatorship can be seen as, uh, as, uh, 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 as a regime where you have a single party system, but at the same time, multiple forms of uh, of, uh, of ownerships uh, and properties in the, in the economy. In such a way, if you see the situation in 2023, the different post-communist regimes, some of them, what we, 12, what we used as an example, they, you can put uh, uh, in this triangle in different, uh, different places. Now, first part, I would concentrate on patronal, patronal autocracy, uh, which is a monopolized form of, uh, of patronalism. And the question is that why would we call them mafia states? If we separate, uh, when we try to describe these regimes, four dimensions, the basic question, who is the actor? They never try to answer this question. They simply say that ruling elite, ruling elite is a very neutral expression does not say anything about the structure and sociological uh, nature of the, of the ruling elite. If they want to emphasize that this ruling elite is mainly informal, they say network state. It's a right description, but of course too wide. What kind of network? If it's a hierarchical one, we could say it's a patronal one. And if a special type of patronal, a clan state, when it means that the structure and sociological anthropological form of the ruling elite is nothing else than an extended form of a patriarchal family, where like in clans, you can adopt different families and transfer the, their relations into quasi-kinship relations, the non-kinship relations. These are clans. And in uh, patron autocracies, like Hungary, Russia, Central Asian countries, they are clan states. It's a valid naming of that regime, but only reflects of one dimension of that state, whether concerning the actor. If we want to speak about that, what is the uh, ruling elite's relation to the uh, uh, public authority? If the public authority is expropriated for private use, you know, you can speak about a patrimonial state using the Max Weberian term. When ne neo patrimonial practically shows that under the facade of democratic uh, 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 democratic constitutions, etc., it's neo patrimonial. If you think about what happens with the public goods or the uh, assets of others who are not in power, you can speak about rent seeking state, but the rent seeking in itself is not necessarily a criminal act. It can be just the expansion of the uh, 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 state range of state companies putting uh, uh, party cadres in such positions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when you are speaking about kleptocratic state, it's already a criminal act, but a peaceful one, just taking away revenues and incomes, but not assets. But predatory state means when you practically hunt down uh, the property of other entrepreneurs with the help of state coercion, with a concerted action of different state organizations. Uh, and the last uh, dimension is legality. Uh, we can speak about the corrupt state when corruption can be endemic, but at the same time, it's not a, a, a system defining element of that regime. Uh, uh, when you are speaking about captured state, no, generally we, uh, we understand under this expression, a bottom up, uh, the type of uh, state capture when oligarchic or criminal groups are capturing certain segments of the state. But the criminal state, when we are speaking about the criminal state, when an economic political clan captures the state, the markets, the economy, and the oligarchs themselves, 
And this happened, for example, in Hungary after 2010. This happened in Russia in 2003, when one economic political clan captured this. And when these four uh, requirements, I would say, ironically fulfilled, that the state is a clan state, a patrimonial or neo-patrimonial state, a predatory state, and a criminal state, then we can say that it's a mafia state. And we use the term post-communist mafia state because now we were dealing just with post-communist uh, post regimes, and not with uh, uh, not with others. And such a way, of course, if you want to make a distinction between uh, patron autocracy, what about I spoke until this time, and patron democracy, where a lot of countries, for example, Ukraine and a lot of Eastern European countries belongs, you see that in a patronal democracy, uh, there is not a single pyramid informal patronal network, but it's a multi-pyramid informal patronal system. Uh, there, the oligarchs on polygarchs, the polygarchs we use for such a term when a politician has, a polygarch has a formal political power, but an informal economic one, while in the case of oligarch is just the reverse, a formal economic power and an informal political one, but they are uh, uh, partially patronalized and they have some independency, not like in a patron autocracy. This is why we can speak about semi-autonomous or autonomous oligarchs. The, uh, the elites in that society are competing patronal political elites and not a, a monopolized one. Uh, there is only state uh, uh, capture, and the corruption is a structural deviation, but not a system constituting element. So if we try to uh, tie uh, uh, this model to the different types of so-called capitalism, it's a patron capitalism and not a mafia capitalism. And now it's, uh, it shows that there are different trajectories of post-communist regimes for uh, four basic trajectories can be separated from each other, where in each trajectory, trajectory we make a difference between the political level and the, and the level of patronalism, a type of patronalism of these uh, changes. So, for example, the first type, when from a communist dictatorship uh, you go to liberal democracy, for example, in the beginning of the 90s, Estonia, Poland, Hungary at that time, from a liberal, from a communist dictatorship, liberal democracy, but from a single pyramid bureaucratic patronal system into a uh, into a liberal democracy, a multi pyramid non patronal one. But most of the post communist regimes, they went on the B track, uh, and never reached uh, uh, the status of liberal democracy, but the patronal democracy, and they mainly remained there which meant that from a communist dictatorship, they became patronal democracies from a single pyramid bureaucratic patronal system, a multi-pyramid, a multi-pyramid informal patronal system. And of course, the third type, patronal autocracy, uh, which went directly patronal autocracy, for example, Kazakhstan, Central Asian Soviet republics uh, with a uh, uh, small uh, uh, curve outside Russia also, which, uh, but mainly Central Asian post-communist regimes directly went from a communist dictatorship to a patron autocracy, from a single pyramid system, which was bureaucratic patron to a single pyramid informal one, informal patronal, uh, patronal, uh, patronal system. These are the uh, major primary trajectories. And the next one are the secondary trajectories. And from the secondary trajectories, we choose those one which uh, uh, reached the status of liberal democracy. And for example, Poland started to go towards the direction of conservative autocracy, never reached it. There was no, um, there was no uh, uh, autocratic breakthrough. And now with the elections where Donald Tusk and his allies uh, won the elections is turning back. The other way, from a liberal democracy towards patronal democracy. This was an experiment uh, by Bobish, for example, in Czech Republic, never reached the patronal democracy status, but it was turned back. Uh, in the case of Hungary, it went from a liberal democracy to a patronal autocracy uh, after 2010, through, a, as I mentioned, a, uh, an autocratic breakthrough, uh, uh, the autocratic, uh, autocratic uh, 
consolidation consolidation process. So these are the basic routes. Uh, now the secondary trajectory is within this triangle, and we think that it helps to to give a better explanation for the real nature of these societies. And now uh, let's turn to the other part of the uh, presentation where Valent will speak about uh, uh, Ukraine's uh, uh, cyclical character of move in this model. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. Uh, now I will turn to the case of Ukraine, and uh, the case of Ukraine is, uh, as was mentioned in the beginning, is uh, our most recent project. And I would like to start uh, by just saying that I'm really proud of this two-volume collection that was just published at the CU Press, and it is open access freely downloadable for, for everyone, because we have over 30 authors and uh, almost uh, half of them are, or actually more than half of them are Ukrainian authors and scholars who who accepted this descriptive framework, who accepted this understanding of Ukraine as a patriarchal democracy. And together we try to understand uh, the last 30 years of Ukraine, the uh, uh, Ukrainian regime and the dynamics of the regime, and also the structural consequences of the war. Now, if you look into the trajectory of Ukraine, and we put it into this triangle, what we have to observe first is that it doesn't really uh, fit into those straight lines that we just uh, were shown by Balint uh, with the primary and secondary trajectories. Rather, what we see is that it shows that pendulum-like movement. A pendulum like movement, just going up and down, up and down, it changes from communist dictatorship when Soviet Union collapses, then it changes to a patronal democracy. And then there is under Kuchma uh, an attempt to go to patronal autocracy. Then it is turned back. Then afterwards, it is going down once again, and it is turned back once again. So there is this up and down kind of movement, which is uh, described in our books as regime cycles. So we understand this as regime cycles. Now, if we want to understand regime cycles, we have to understand the concept of patronal democracy and what it really means and why it is really different from a liberal democracy. So in patronal autocracy, sorry, patronal democracy, as Balint uh, already mentioned, what seems to be party competition is in fact the competition of informal patron client networks. So every, uh, every party, which, uh, which, uh, which is formally uh, a left-wing party or right-wing party, an ideological party, is in fact an, an organization that is used by some of the informal networks. As Balint mentioned, with patronalism, decisions are moved out from the formal institutions into informal circles. The decisions are made by the informal networks and they use the parties. They use the parties to channel their informal agendas to the former realm of politics. Now, in such a system, in such a system, any network gets into power, it will try to expand its own power. Every, uh, in, a, in a competing situation, every network wants to become dominant. Every network would be very happy if they could just establish a kind of single pyramid rule that Orban has in Hungary or Putin has in Russia. So this is why we say that in such a system, uh, legitimacy challenge, is not an anomaly, but it is the norm. In such a system, in a patronal democracy, democracy is always in danger. It is always in danger because the ruling network, the network that is in power, always tries to expand its own power and to marginalize, eliminate, or subjugate all the competing networks, the opposition networks. However, what we saw in the case of Ukraine is that these attempts to become dominant were never fulfilled. And why? It is because none of the networks, none of the ruling networks have been strong enough to actually dominate over the others. Every time the, a ruling network tried to become a dominant one, it was the autocratic attempt was repelled. It was repelled by the opposition networks, which were uh, stronger together against the, the ruling network, and also by a free civil society. A free civil society had a great part in this. And this is why there were, there were always autocratic attempts, but it never reached the position of autocratic breakthrough. As Bannett mentioned in 
uh, in Hungary in 2010, uh, mainly because of the disproportionate election system on the one hand and the undivided executive power on the other hand. Uh, in 2010, Viktor Orban got into a position of supermajority, and that was enough for him to change the constitution, the electoral law one-sidedly, and practically to break down the system of checks and balances. This never happened in the case of Ukraine. In the case of Ukraine, an autocratic breakthrough couldn't happen. And even though there were attempts, they could be turned back by electoral means or extra electoral means, by which, of course, I mean the color revolutions, the Orange Revolution and the Euromaidan Revolution, or as the Ukrainians like to call it, the Revolution of Dignity. However, the problem is this. The problem is that, uh, is, uh, I should start by saying that the problem is perhaps not that much obvious, because for Western observers, when Western observers looked at the color revolutions, they were usually very optimistic. They were usually very optimistic. Why? Because they were thinking on that democracy dictatorship axis shown by Bali. In the democracy dictatorship axis, when you have a single axis, then when you have an oppressive regime, that is closer to dictatorship. When it is defeated, it goes back towards democracy. So they interpreted the color revolutions as now, oh, finally, the tyrant is defeated, the people are now victorious, and now finally the country will move closer to democracy, or obviously on a single axis to Western type liberal democracy. However, what actually happened was that only the ruling network was defeated, but the opposition networks, they remained. The opposition networks remained. The oligarchic structures remained. What happened was that there was a democratic transformation, but there was no anti-patronal transformation. There was an attempt to change from the multi-pyramid informal system to a single pyramid one, an anti-democratic transformation, an autocratic attempt. And then it was turned back, but only to go back to square one. Because when the opposition networks remained, well, another network will come to power and it will once again try to break down the system. And that attempt is repelled and then we go back to square one once again. So this is what creates this kind of cyclical movement that they try to move from the multi-pyramid system into a single pyramid one, but then it is uh, actually by the color revolutions, only the multi-pyramid competitive system is what is, uh, uh, what is restored. Now the main question is whether the war can change some of this and whether Ukraine can break out of the rest of cycles. Now, uh, I take this table from the book, uh, from one of the studies by Oksana Hus, uh, who analyzed anti-corruption policies. And she found that before the Maidan revolution, anti-corruption policies, they were mainly weapons of the ruling network against the opposition networks. So usually what happened with anti-corruption policies was that the ruling networks uh, tried to uh, persecute the corruption of others, practically to weaken and eliminate the competing networks while extending their own corrupt uh, informal patron, uh, patron client network. Now, with the, after the Maidan revolution, uh, there was a, a really a, a mushrooming of various NGOs, various anti-corruption movements throughout Ukraine. And with uh, 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 and uh, since then, uh, what we see is really an attack not just on the corruption of one uh, network or just the opposition networks or just the lower levels of corruption, but against the corrupt system as a whole. Really, there is an anti-patronal agenda uh, in the air since uh, since the Maidan uh, revolution. Also, with the election of Zelensky, with the election of Zelensky, what we see is that um, is that he also has a distinctly anti-patronal agenda. He really uh, has this anti-oligarch law. He tries to break down all those networks and all the uh, uh, all the oligarchic uh, structures uh, within Ukraine. With the war, with the war, what we see is now that he can centralize power. Zelensky obviously centralizes power because in a, in a war, the state goes into war mode, meaning there are no elections, uh, protests are not allowed, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a power centralization on the one hand. And on the other hand, he tries to neutralize the oligarchs and have all these anti-oligarchic means nationalizing their enterprises and their property and so on and so forth. And uh, sometimes uh, it is argued that, okay, so what does... Uh, Zelensky do, he centralizes power and he neutralizes the oligarchs. But what did Putin do back in 2003? Well, he centralized power and neutralized the oligarchs. So are they really doing the same? 
are we witnessing now in the case of Ukraine, the creation of a single pyramid network, something that no one was able to do before with the, all this, uh, during all these regime cycles? And our answer uh, in this book is no. Our answer is no, because Zelensky actually rules a single pyramid network, but that is not a patronal network. There are some similarities. Uh, this is also one, from one of the studies. We developed this table together with Mikhail Minakov. And um, we found that there are four similarities between the kind of network that Zelensky has and the kind of network that Putin or Orban has. For example, they are pyramid-like hierarchies. There is personal loyalty of the clients. We can read about this you know, in the news, how Zelensky puts his own uh, loyal people into, into positions. There is an increasing power of the president, decreasing power of the parliament. Even before the war broke out, this was the case. So th there are these similarities. However, there are dissimilarities, key dissimilarities. First, decisions are moved to a formal body and not to an informal one. In a, in a, in a Putin kind of system, as Balint mentioned, the decisions are moved to the patron's court, the chief patron's court, to an informal circle where some people have formal positions, like the president or prime minister, or some people and some people don't have any kind of formal position, like oligarchs and the, the close people to the chief patron, only what they have is influenced through their strong ties to the chief patron. That is a kind of patron's court outside the former bodies of government and, and party. Whereas in the case of Zelensky, decisions are moved to a former body to this Na National Security Council uh, of Ukraine. Also, there are normative anti-oligarchic measures. So in the case of a patronal system, the key element is that the chief patron has the power to give discretional rewards and punishments, to give to, to decide in a targeted manner who is punished, who is rewarded. This is how dependencies are created. Now, in the case of Zelensky, every oligarch falls uh, under the anti-oligarchic measures. Even the oligarch who supported Zelensky in the beginning, there was a house arrest uh, at, in his case. Also, uh, companies are taken over, wells are taken over. So really, we can see in the case of Zelensky a, a kind of normativity, which means that uh, the case is not that the insiders are protected and only outsiders are attacked. Rather, everyone, uh, all the oligarchic structures are attacked. Also, there are no new patron bred oligarchs. Also in the book, there is a study uh, on the... Uh, uh, on, uh, on the uh, status of Ukrainian oligarchs. And what is explained there, that in those areas that the Russians occupy, one of the first thing that they did is that uh, the Russians, they immediately started to take over local companies. They immediately started to take over from the Ukrainian owners and transfer them by state coercion to their own local oligarchs. So immediately, if you look at a patronal network, this is how it works. It wants to accumulate power and accumulate wealth. And everywhere it goes, it tries to do that. We do not see that in the case of Zelensky. And also we do not see so-called transit nationalization. Transit nationalization means that a company is taken into temporary state care, it is nationalized, and then it is, uh, it is uh, privatized in a targeted manner. It is nationalized, then it is given to one of the clients of the network. This is what we call transit nationalization. You see it all the time in patronal autocracies, but you do not see in the case of Zelensky, we do not see, for example, that those companies that were taken over by uh, or from the, from the oligarchs would be given to some of Zelensky's own uh, clients in his own network. This is why we see, say that what Zelensky leads is a bureaucratic, a bureaucratic single pyramid rather than an informal patronal single pyramid. And this is why, uh, and this is my last slide. This is why we say that the the threat for post-war Ukraine is not that it would move downwards to a Putin kind of system towards patronal autocracy. The threat is rather what we call the Saakashvili scenario. The Saakashvili scenario is uh, what we saw in the case of Georgia uh, after the Rose Revolution in 2003. So the Saakashvili government comes to power. It has an, an unprecedented level of uh, political legitimacy and an unprecedented level of concentration of power and then a very distinct anti-patronal agenda. So they make uh, very strong steps to break down local oligarchic structures. There is an anti-patronal transformation or at least an attempt at that, but there is no democratic transformation. Democracy is not restored in that case and therefore they move to conservative autocracy. And this is now the threat. This is now the threat that Zelensky perhaps breaks down the oligarchic structures but maybe democracy won't be restored in a way 
that it should be destroyed uh, or should be uh, restored. So, uh, and in this book, uh, what we really try to analyze uh, with, the, with our Ukrainian colleagues and also Hungarian and some Russian colleagues, how uh, and what are the conditions for uh, that after the war, Ukraine will actually go towards uh, the case of liberal democracy, or toward the uh, type of liberal democracy. So now at, there is a chance to break out of these regime cycles and from this cyclical character of patronal democracy, it should go towards liberal democracy rather than conservative autocracy. Thank you for your attention. Great, thanks very much. Lovely, thanks. And your slides, I think, are available on your website, yes, post communist yes. regimes, for yes. those of you who website, want to download them or those Twitter, watching and, online. And the diagrams are there. Okay, I think we'll turn first of all to Henry Hale, who I'm going to bring up hope on the screen. Henry, can you hear us? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We just want to get you up on screen if we can manage that. Yes. Um, would you like to just go ahead and comment on some some aspects of um, of um, of what we've heard and these um, ideas and this perspective? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, so uh, just thought, first of all, I want to thank you all for the uh, invitation to this very interesting uh, event. And, and uh, it's an honor to be in the company of so many great scholars, uh, both involved in the volume and uh, not involved in the volume, but who are part of the larger research project that this um, is part of. And um, so maybe I'll, I'll just uh, build a little bit on um, what was said and comment on uh, some of the implications for how we understand what's going on with the war and its prospects. Um, and just uh, prior to Russia's all out invasion of Ukraine, uh, at least in the United States, I, I think it's fair to say that Ukraine mostly appeared in media that ordinary people would read in terms of the lens of corruption or various scandals. You know, occasionally something like, oh, wow, they elected a comedian to be uh, president, right? Um, but the corruption scandal seems to be the first thing that would come to mind for ordinary people prior to seeing what we saw after uh, February of 2022. Um, and uh, the the phenomena that were identified as corruption, as they're typically talked about in uh, you know ordinary media uh, and, and just ordinary conversation and, and the punditry, um, you know, the corruption was understood as meaning a couple of things. Uh, one was that Ukraine was a hopelessly corrupt country, uh, full of mercenary elites who would basically be willing to sell out anything, including their own national sovereignty. And also, it kind of came with this implication that. Um, the political system was so decayed that it was likely not going to be able to defend itself effectively, even if it tried uh, with what happened after 2014 being held up as an example. Um, and so, you know, these were perceptions that had existed prior to what we saw in um, February of 2022, when suddenly the world became awakened to the idea that, wow, you know, look at this country mobilized and look at how effectively they can defend themselves and how well they're managing despite this onslaught from what was uh, perceived to be a much, much more powerful uh, neighbor, even a military juggernaut. Um, so clearly something in this interpretation was off. Um, although I have to say, uh, you know, hearing the debates in the US Congress about whether to support Ukraine, sometimes these tropes come back, right? This reliance on the idea that, well, there's corruption there, uh, therefore, um, you know, we can't rely on Ukraine to do anything. And these things are kind of contradictory, right? If you uh, you see what's happening on the ground. It's clear um, that uh, Ukraine is an extremely capable state. Um, but on the other hand, if you uh, just see it through this lens of, of corruption, um, one has trouble understanding it. And I think one of the things this book shows, uh, along with other work uh, by uh, the, the editors, uh, as well as others in this room, is that this is not simply a problem of lacking information about Ukraine, about um, kind of the, the nature of corruption or something like that. Uh, instead, it reflects a much bigger problem, which is that the conceptual frameworks through which we typically interpret politics in Ukraine, as well as many other countries in the world, uh, simply do not fit. Um, and they're based on models that were built to understand very different societies. Um, and this book, I think, helps us as another step in helping us unpack how this is the case. So um, the opening chapter uh, where, um, the editors, uh, Magyar Milovich, um, kind of lay out a, a summary of their conceptual framework as it applies to the case of Ukraine and the war in Russia. 
um, uh, shows how conventional thinking uh, tends to depict a, a spectrum of regimes ranging from liberal democracy to dictatorship, uh, as you just heard in the presentation, and that most theory of regimes has been developed with respect to the former pole, or that, that, that one pole of liberal democracy kind of being the anchor for theoretical work. So countries that didn't come very close to that pole and didn't seem to fit this ideal type very well came to be studied primarily in terms of what they lacked, right? In terms of what their deviation was from it. Um, but by describing regimes, mainly in terms of what they lack, um, rather than what they are, um, and, and perhaps more insidiously, by describing them using vocabulary tailored to such exercises, um, we fail to fully appreciate the elaborate political and economic social systems that actually are at work in these countries. Um, and so this book is part of a large effort here, as I mentioned before, building on the work of many others involved in this event um, to provide uh, this kind of elaboration and really help us um, move forward. And I, I think one of the uh, signature contributions of the editors has been to provide um, uh, not only kind of a whole new grammar, if you would, uh, about uh, to how to understand it and to talk about it, but a whole new vocabulary uh, for helping us kind of escape the uh, Procrestean bed of, of the terms that we talk about regimes with um, that were really meant for other types of systems. So um, a couple of things that I think this volume helps us understand relevant to the uh, the events that we're seeing now in, in Ukraine and, and involving Russia in the world is that, um, for one thing, patronalism is not incompatible with uh, democracy. And so again, it's it's not uh, it, it's not really compatible with liberal democracy, but you can have a vibrant competitive political system in which voters have the final say on um, the directions in which a country goes uh, under a paternalistic system. It's just a different system with these competing pyramids of power um, uh, rather than a, a single pyramid system of power in, as in a, in a typical uh, patronal dictatorship. Um, also, I think one thing that sometimes gets uh, overlooked a little bit is that the um, um, Another thing that this framework helps us understand is that the participation by ordinary politicians and uh, certainly ordinary people in these various systems, in this paternalistic system, um, does not make them uh, primarily uh, kleptocrats, right? We can't boil everything down to the stealing that's involved or to the extent that there is stealing and certainly not as a wholly cynical corruptioneers. People involved in these systems um, have values like everybody else. Um, you know, again, you get some bad apples, uh, and often they become corrupted once they get to the top of the system, uh, power corrupts. Um, but I think one of the most important things about the, these systems is that they are sustained less because the people involved actually want this kind of system to exist. Again, once you get to the very top, then there, those kinds of desires can take over when you really get power. Um, but uh, in fact, I think the, the fundamental um, sustaining feature and sustaining factor here is that uh, so many people come to believe that this is just the way things are done. And so, you know, you have to engage in these kinds of practices and, you know, to, to pay the bribe, bribe to the doctor to make sure you get a good, good service, um, just because that's the way things are done. And, um, and, and many people who are engaged in these um, uh, kind of the, these networks and the, the power dynamics of them, um, especially at the lower levels, uh, as you get down to ordinary people, um, are actually just involved in it to be, meet the needs of daily life under difficult circumstances, or even to serve the interests of others, uh, sometimes trying to serve the interests of their communities or country. Um, but they are just believing that this happens to be the most effective way to get something done, or maybe the least bad among options. Uh, and so actually, if you have a chance, if you haven't looked at it to uh, watch Zelensky's Servant of the People uh, TV series, it's just in, in some ways a brilliant uh, exposition of exactly how this works and the, the motivations, the different kinds of motivations that bring people in it. Um, a lot of which uh, you, you can very much sympathize with people and they feel themselves trapped in a situation that effectively forces them to engage in this or um, lose out or face tremendous difficulty if they try to avoid it. Um, and I think uh, Aliona's work on blot networks, uh, among other things, is uh, also just a terrific analysis of how a lot of this works. So I think one implication is that simply to see uh, what 
fits is this idea of corruption, this kind of oversimplified notion of corruption, and think that people are therefore willing to sell out something as valuable to them as their country is just a colossal misinterpretation. Um, even though it might appear, even from the inside, that people can be bought off very easily. Um, and Putin himself seems to have fallen into this conceptual trap, like realizing his mistake only afterwards, um, thinking that, well, you know, you can, we could just buy off the Ukrainian elites. They'll, they'll, they'll fall into line. We just give them enough money or, you know, tighten the screws on them a little bit. Um, but what is, it was failed to be appreciated was that there's a big difference between buying the domestic political goods and services that these patronal politicians typically peddle and attempting to buy their support for a murderous foreign policy of a domineering neighbor. Um, and so that was something that, you know, the vast majority, even of, of purportedly kind of corrupt uh, Ukrainian elites were not willing to go. So there wa was principle involved and there were limits to what they wanted to do. Um, and I think one, one great thing about this volume, uh, this latest volume in particular, is that um, Ukrainian scholars themselves have done some of the most important work in building up this tradition. Um, you know, I, I myself, for example, have relied a lot on the work of Oleksandr Fisun, who's one of the contributing authors here. And there's also a vibrant community of rising scholars in Ukraine who are doing great research and starting to get their work um, published in internationally recognized peer-reviewed outlets as books or articles. And this new volume helps bring just a, a, a really impressive community of them together to amplify their voices and help build up the work uh, that they're doing together and kind of help coordinate the different voices and ideas together. Um, and uh, just, I think in, in closing, I'll just say, you know, many of these scholars in particular are focused on the future. And so a lot of the book is actually forward looking um, as was mentioned in the presentation just a minute ago by the, um, the editors. Uh, and so there's a lot in this volume that talks about, uh, you know, what kinds of pressures can help countries move past this paternalistic um, equilibrium. So uh, different chapters emphasize uh, how under conditions of patronal democracy, which is far from a perfect liberal democracy, you can get reforms that can make a difference. The decentralization reform that began in 2014 seems to have been very, very important in sowing the seeds for a weakening of paternalistic practices there. Um, the civil society and, of course, the impulse to civic activism provided by the war. Um, and um, again, there are a lot of challenges that need to be uh, faced. I think it's very important that, uh, you know, to keep in mind that the that the what we see today in terms of societal activism in response to the war won't necessarily continue after the war. So much of it's going to depend on what the leadership does to encourage it. Um, but I think uh, that, you know there are there are reasons for hope after that. Uh, anyway, I'll be happy to talk about all that or more, but I should stop now because I'm really eager to hear what the others have to say. So thank you for your attention, and um, I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Great, thanks, Henry. And I think we might we later on in Q and A we might pick up some of these themes of, of what people should do differently through these different understandings of post-communist regimes. Interesting as well that you suggest that there might be lessons for for, for Putin from this book, which we won't pick up. Um, on that and to Cheryl, I think we... Um, Do I hold both of these? Ideally, yes. Um, All right. The big one is Can the... you hear me okay? I'm a loud American, even with a mask on, so... Um, oh, yes, there you go. But I'm not very technical. How's that? Much better. The main thing is the, the, the big yes. mic, the big mic yeah. is the one that matters. Okay, well... You have to be able to hear me. Um, I would like to focus on the resources that this book has in it because I'm a person who has had a lot of problems explaining what's going on in the region for several decades, starting with Vladimir Mechar privatizing things for his friends at a very cheap price. I had no way to explain that because I was working with this old paradigm, right? Then being in Serbia, and trying to understand this Vujic pyramid, it even struck me as a pyramid. So then I read Henry's book and I was relieved because I started to have a way to explain it. But, and, and especially with the way in which elections can be used as a way to solidify a regime. And you'll see that probably again in December in Serbia. So Henry Hale's book, Paternal Politics, talks a lot about elections. I would like to come in on parties, which are discussed really well in this book as well and um, kind of start with that as a resource that I found in this book. So parties, as opposed to the way I talk about parties in my democracy classes, 
So it, parties are supposed to be functional. Sorry, I'm going to drop my notes. They're supposed to channel different interests in the typical paradigm. But Vucic's party isn't doing that. Mechar's party didn't do that. So what's going on instead? Well, parties are a way to bring in loyalists and to distribute resources. And they're basically channels through which these things can flow. They're not programmatic, meaning they might not have any ideology except to capture these resources. And they're not serving that function of aggregating interests. They might have nothing to do with the population that actually votes for them. They just have to make sure that there's a mechanism to bring in those votes. So this is the description of parties that you find in their book, which is, ex well, books, which is extremely useful. Also, there aren't any factions because there's no ideology. It's all really about moving these resources around. Now, one question I would have for you is, is this really just something limited to the former Soviet bloc? Because you also have enterprising elites in the West, so Boris Johnson in the UK, Donald Trump in the US, who tried these strategies, but perhaps broke their parties because they didn't quite succeed, but they left the parties in rubble, and we see the effects of that. Are there ways to think about elite agency and trying to achieve these things? And then when they don't succeed, what are we left with and how that might work in the West? All right. I'm going to just focus on one other area. So parties, great, different way to think about parties. Another thing I would like to emphasize, and this is sort of where I'm really going to focus and then I'll close. Um, it's very important to understand how the Orban regime has reached down to the very local level, including controlling mayors and with a very comprehensive system to make sure mayors have to be lo loyal to the state or to, the, to Orban, really. That is unprecedented. I haven't seen this in any other country, the degree to which control goes down to the very small level with very successful mechanisms to achieve that kind of loyalty. And this is well described in the book. So in my own research, I was wondering, how does this play out in places? So for Vujic, you also have other ethnic groups in Serbia who have their own parties. How do you deal with those? Well, you can co-opt them, which Vujic has effectively done. So the Hungarian party in Vojvodina and Serbia has been attached to the Vujic pyramid. But you can also find places of resisting this. So in Romania, there are pockets of resistance. Local barons, as comes out in the Laszlo, I was going Laszlo Nandor Magyari chapter. Romania is an incomplete version of this. It's dual pyramids. There are pockets of resistance. This also empowers those local barons to bargain with one pyramid or another. So you have de facto a situation of stronger potential local resistance in a place with two pyramids versus a place like Hungary where everything is sucked into the same pyramid. This provides a useful way to think about comparative research. So how far is the state reaching down to the ground level? We can look at city politics and county politics to think about that. Um, and this kind of saturation level, if you will, can be a way you can use this particular book as a resource with books to think about comparatively across countries. It's one way we can say Orban is extremely successful at running Hungary, whether we like it or not. And those who wish to emulate his strategies would probably have to reproduce this local level reach because there's really no way to think about an opposition emerging very effectively. All right. So also those triangle graphs they have are fantastic. Um, Charles Tilley, who was my supervisor, actually had this idea in a book called Democracy from 2007, where he was using these squiggles to trace out how you can go forward into democracy, but also backslide. And Sean might remember that came up at a presentation several years ago. These triangles are a fantastic way to innovate on that, to not just think about going in one direction. What is backsliding? Well, it could be around sliding and moving all around to these different categories. Um, 
So with that, that's those are my only comments, but I would like to hear about these ideas potentially applying outside of the East and how you might respond to that. We will come back to that. And I think, Valent, there is on your website, there's a kind of animated moving 3D model, which is very, very uh, illuminating. Wow. And I recommend... Why don't you show it? Um, do you want to show it? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. just answer a few questions now. Yeah. Um, oh, but yeah, yeah, shall we? Yeah. Yeah, but then. Should you want? Um, well, first, we should have a Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, no, no, I'm the chair. I'm the, I'm the chair. I, I have a few questions, but I'll throw them in this time. This time. Right. I think Sean is uh, sleeping off this one. <laughs> you want me to attach that? Yeah. If. Yeah. It's a little, it's a funny little clip. Yeah. And you don't want it to fall. There we go. Anyway, no surprises here, I guess, because we all um, love what um, the colleagues have done. Otherwise, we wouldn't have written those uh, prefaces, right, Henry? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's um, we all seem to be on a panel within the same tribe of um, political science or interdisciplinary endeavor, which really looks into how to make models more adjusted to what we know from the field. And it's difficult, and it's difficult for a number of reasons. So I would just like to highlight maybe three problems and three ways out to keep things sort of short. So um, first of all, I love this idea of complexity, and I think it really features very strongly in um, creating more complex models, more sophisticated tables, um, trying to supersede um, dichotomies where we can. However, what um, I think I would um, challenge this uh, audience who is also most advanced in uh, our respective uh, concerns over reality and models as to um, how do we use pyramids which are kind of euphemisms for verticality for something that is meant to be informal. So when you say informal, and patronal, isn't it a problem that is squeezed back into the terminology where we have both vertical and horizontal within the same conceptualization? And you will see that in social theory that exactly what happened with this whole, um, you know, um, dimension, or maybe it's better to say period of social theories such as Giddens and his uh, and his theory of structuration, uh, Bourdieu and his idea of habitus, uh, Habermas and his idea of the knowledge of interest. So what we have, we have impossibility to work with dualisms and with duality. Therefore, we compress them and come up with a conceptual tool that is both vertical and horizontal. Um, and make sure that no one else knows that because we just came up with a new uh, concept and we get citation, not someone else. So I am really challenged by this idea of pyramid because I don't see how it works as a model for the kind of informality that I know and collect over the globe, which is to say informal power could not be depicted as a pyramid. So, and when we start transferring our mental templates of formal power and hierarchy onto the informal area, we have a problem. And that's a problem number one. Number one. The problem number two for me is um, an issue of informal institution. The way I read Douglas North work um, um well the one on institutions and institutional change 
So the idea where he actually revolutionizes the notion of institution exactly the same way as to what Giddens and Bourdieu have done in social theory. But he says it's not just formal institutions that I am dealing with, but I'm dealing with institutions which are humanely devised constraints, um, which are both formal and informal. So formal constraints are imposed top down, informal constraints are imposed either bottom up or sideways. Now, um, if we agree that the notion of institutions includes both kinds of constraints, which means political parties are inhabited by people and they might have interests and motivations and standards and values very different from that pyramid that we think they have, that complexity we cannot um, accommodate. I would go even more provocative and pick on the mafia state directly. Mafia in political science, if we read um, efforts of people to create an example of informal institution. Mafia is an informal institution, I'm told. From what I know from, from the Global Informality Project, Mafia is not an informal institution. It's a legal, illegal, formal institution. There is nothing informal about mafia. It's a pyramid. It works in a vertical way. It has 100% enforcement of its codified regulations. So to me, yes, it is illegal, but quite formal, actually. Just on the other side, of legality line. Now, informal for me, something is very different, which is associated with fluidity of networks, with uncertainty of the outcome, with kind of ever-changing human relationships and the use of those relationships very often in an inappropriate context. And what you see in terms of you know problems in corruption studies, for example, they have this model of um, principal agent client relationship, which is already a triangle. Good. <laughs> and you'd think it's enough. But actually, what happens if the principal is not principled? And I think that's exactly your problem. It's, you know, non principled principle. And what the way out uh, people found in the policy world for that dilemma? is actually idea of collection action, transformation of social norm, changing that kind of horizontal type of peer pressure in order to get out of um, that one. So the third problem that I would briefly uh, say, I'm sorry, it's not very brief, uh, goodness me, um, time goes. So East-West relationship and the domination of Anglo-Saxon peer-reviewed journals in the, um, in the discourse. So basically what it takes for a Ukrainian scholar to, to, to publish in a peer-reviewed journal in the United States, it means one should relearn language, academic discourse, writing style, reference style, everything. By that point, that researcher stops being local and becomes kind of, you know, uh, double-edged or Janus faced or, you know, whichever way. Um, and you could include me in that. Because, you know, when I speak to Russian scholars, they tell me, no, I'm sorry, we cannot collaborate with you because uh, you just on, on the other side. Um, and you speak all that language that we don't understand. And the field is much more complex that you make it look. And then the other way, uh, you know, the peer reviewed will impose such a rigid um, editorial comments on you that it would be impossible to say even at your level of complexity to, to have it published because it doesn't fit exactly within the field. So that's the third problem. I, I've got about seven more, but I'm going <laughs> to stop at that. And just um, speak maybe about three takeaways uh, for me. 
first of all, what we have here is a great ambition to accommodate complexity into modeling and the effort which is I have a lot of sympathy with, which is create comparisons which are context rich. Lots of people do it in a very different way. In my project, I try to put the data together in a way so that it's clear which patterns of informal governance are universal and which ones are specific to the context. But you could only do that if you read seven entries on the same subject, as it were. So that kind of saturation point where you realize where the um, critical area studies uh, cross over in, in the um, model and what remains as a kind of regional specifics. Um, second, I would say that um, is specific to uh, my project, but I think you also aim and certainly Cheryl does that, is to include the voice of the participant into the uh, discourse of an observer. And that um, interesting intersection might sound like a good thing, but if you, if you imagine, for example, the anti-corruption policy thinking, then what? Do we include the voice of the corrupt into the thinking of the anti-corruption reforms, right? It's almost like including the legal firm to the parliamentary debates on the tax code um, evolution and then, you know, that very firm using the loopholes which were identified by that very firm and not closed. So you have that kind of interesting policy making implications of um, the uh, voice of the insider. And yet I think without it, we will never understand what works because they are the holders of the know-how. And that know-how is essential for scholars if we want to be uh, relevant for, for policy making in, in some kind of way. I'm sorry, I'm uh, talking probably um, very um, trivial things here, but um, I think it's, for me, it's essential to kind of think about ideal types, but also um, look at them logically in the sense that for me, for example, Putin's networks, are not informal in any way. Why? Because I listen to the voice of the insiders. And what they are telling me, the minute you he became a president, you stop calling him by the first name. You could not address informally the president the way you did before. You have to constantly have that kind of uh, understanding as to when you're welcome, when you're not. So there is a constant reflection that is going on as to how you would play access to the power. And that kind of considerations um, make me think that when we talk about informal networks of the president and the way in which that is replicated in the regions that at the local level, as you say, we really have to think of maybe um, informal governance as a, as a better tools of informal governance, as, as a better way of referring to that reality than just simply informal networks that he uses for um, getting things done in Russia. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to say anything about Ukraine. I hope and Andy will do. It's it. okay. We've, we've we've had some problems in Ukraine, so that's that's it's okay. Um, there we go. There we go. I'll do that. Okay. And I do that. Anglo-Saxon means American and English language. Yeah. US UK overall. U US UK. Okay. Um, <laughs> I understand that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
I try to answer for some questions, and 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 Balint will show this three D three D model, which is really a tool what anybody could use. You know, uh, the first thing that why we concentrate on post communist countries uh, because we do not know no more. You know, so 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 this is this is where at least me I was grown up. You know, and I have personal experiences as well, experiences as well. But uh, of course, we were asked several times uh, how could we expand our model for other countries, mainly post-colonial ones and other hybrid regimes. Uh, I think that for, uh, uh, for, such, for such a try, um, uh, we should give, give up and dismiss some other axioms as well. For example, uh, in the case of post-communist regimes, it was not questioned that the formal cover of patron client networks are political parties. But if you go out, maybe they can be religious organizations, the military itself, so other other type of formal careers of informal relations, of, of informal relations. So we should have opened this axiom as well. And other axiom, what we should open, that uh, we assumed as it, it was in the whole post-communist world, that there were no failed states. Uh, practically only at the beginning of the 90s, Russia, Ukraine, uh, uh, were somehow in an oligarchic anarchy or something like that, but not failed states. What What is the situation? The, the state was active. The question was not that whether it's a fair state or not, but the question is, was that, that in whose favor uh, it's operating the coercive mechanism of the state. But what happens in, let us in Africa, in several countries where, where the state, state is, a, is a failed state. Uh, if you are thinking about, uh, about other democracies, maybe liberal democracies, where there are such uh, attempts like uh, the United States is Trump, I characterize this situation, I was asked about it, that Trump is a mafioso without a mafia, Putin is a mafioso with a mafia, and it's still a difference. So, 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 so when we are speaking about populism, in our book we write a lot of things that it would need a lot of uh, much more time to speak about it. That that uh, we use uh, uh, the term populism as a model in a more narrower sense than the than the vast literature. Uh, we think that it's uh, uh, basic aim legitimacy challenge, challenging the the legal rational legitimacy and trying to change it into a substantive rational legitimacy. And we make a separation between the demand side and the supply side within the populism. And from the supply side, we say that it's a it's an ideological instrument, not an ideology for a political program. The political program is a legitimacy challenge of a morally unconstrained uh, uh, collective egoism. But I won't go into detail this because it, it would need a lot of other things. So in our model, uh, a lot of other parties which are labeled in the literature as populists, for example, the Syriza, we do not consider them populist parties because they are not legitimacy challenger. They are left-wing ego, uh, left-wing demagogue parties maybe, but we do not consider them such type or even, even those legitimacy challengers uh, which are ideologically consistent, ideology-driven ones like the communist parties, fascist parties, Nazi parties, they, in our in our conceptual framework, they are not populist parties. They are other type of parties. The second question is about the national minorities. Uh, of course, you can uh, you can uh, make another typology for that. In the case of Hungary, uh, what happened with the neighboring Hungarian ethnic minorities in in Slovakia, uh, Transylvania, uh, Voivodeship uh, in in Serbia? So, it was nothing else than the patronization by the organ gov urban governments of these of these national minorities and their institutions and serving the interests of the serving the interests of the of, of the urban regime which meant if the urban regime had good ties uh, with other autocrats uh, uh, like uh, Fico now uh, which is, uh, in Slovakia which is in Serbia etc in spite of that that uh, they were very anti-hungarians at the same time they now the remainings the patronized uh, formations of Hungarian national minorities are has to support these these autocrats because all the financial support is coming from Hungary in a patron-client uh, type of network. 
On the other hand, for example, in North Macedonia, where Gruevsky had an autocratic attempt, uh, uh, but uh, uh, he could not uh, patronize the Albanian minority, and the Albanian minority just uh, got together into a coalition with the with the uh, uh, left-wing parties. Then uh, this autocratic attempt failed, and the uh, in brackets I would say that the Hungarian Secret Service had to escape for Gruevski from North Macedonia and uh, and uh, uh, seeking asylum, getting asylum in Hungary, and he's still living still living there. The third question was, what are the institutional constraints? And this is what about Henry Hale wrote uh, excellent things, and we follow his lines, that the two main formal institutions which hampers the, the uh, emergence of patron autocracy and autocrat autocratic uh, uh, breakthrough, this is the proportionate election system, which makes practically um, not very probable that one single political force could get a, a super majority in the in the parliament and uh, and the constitutional majority uh, and the other is the divided executive power and we see that uh, for example where there are so-called patron autocracies in post-communist regimes they are mainly uh, presidential systems uh, most of those belonging to the uh, to the patronal democracies or liberal democracies, they are mainly semi semi presidential systems where uh, uh, there is a division of executive power between the directly elected president and the parliament uh, nominated uh, nominated government. From this point of view, Hungary is an exception because we have a purely parliamentarian system. Uh, a president without any power, but at the same time, such a disproportionate system, which made possible the this uh, this uh, 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 autocratic breakthrough. And now, uh, turning to Alana's question about informality, and it's absolutely right, and I try to emphasize at the beginning that informality has vertical and horizontal forms. We were not really interested in the horizontal forms, uh, that what are what are their roles in the society, because our main concern was that the uh, uh, neither the politicians uh, from the uh, liberal democracies nor the academic world practically did not understand what's happening in these countries. They could not imagine that such things can happen and the lack of imagination that how can it happen that uh, that uh, uh, that uh, uh, a whole government is, is operated like I would say again a mafia, because, for example, in this huge trial now in Italy about the mafia, they say that, and think of that, that even one uh, member of the parliament was bribed by the mafia. And what happens when the whole parliamentary caucus belongs to the mafia? When what happens when this, uh, uh, when the chief attorney uh, himself belongs to the to this criminal organization? And when we are speak in the normal traditional way of mafia, of course, it's somewhere in the middle of the society because, because uh, they, have to, they have to bribe uh, and, and uh, um, uh, 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 corrupt uh, the politis political level. On the other hand, uh, downward, they are not corrupt. It's not a way of corruption. Uh, it, it's, it's not a kickback money, what is the uh, main transfer uh, asset of the corrupt transactions, but uh, uh, but it's uh, uh, protection. protection money. What 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 they call that? And what happens when this mafia is like the governance itself? Of course, it's not the way as co what is corruption. You know, it's not corruption at all. They do not have to corrupt because they use all means of state coercion, uh, 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 and they do not have to corrupt anybody. So, so we had to face the problem, and this is why we emphasize this vertical character of informality and the criminal state, uh, what is, has this anthropological form of this criminal organization, because not all of the criminal organizations has the form of an extended patriarchal family, of a clan structure. There are other forms of criminal organization, but but these in these post-communist countries have and when we had we had to see for for decades that uh, experts from eu and politicians are coming and trying to convince the government you know uh, how to fight against corruption it resembled us for such a situation when you try to train a lion to be vegetarian <laughs> you know and uh, and they did not understand the situation at the end of the training the lion ate the trainer 
this was the situation. This is what's going on now. You know that uh, that the trainers are coming from the EU, trying to give uh, advices how to fight corruption. But it's not that type of corruption against which uh, uh, we should fight in. We should fight in uh, in Hungary. So. Uh, uh, and therefore, uh, why we try to create a new language for the description, and in our big book, this anatomy of post-communist regimes, uh, we had uh, we made the definition for about 250 categories. Just the definition: how we understand this, because it's a, because most of the categories what are used in the mainstream literature are very slippery ones. Uh, uh, what I mentioned: rent-seeking society. Uh, uh, kleptocratic regime, uh, populism, etc. Everybody understands something different on these names. The problem with the language, that the language determines the in, uh, through the indicators that what kind of data are collected. And the data collected determine the language. And it's a vicious circle. You cannot get out of this. So now what we are working on now, that how can we make and measure the difference between an entrepreneur, a legal status, you have property and legally and formal position from oligarch or all embedded and embedded so-called entrepreneurs. How can it define? And therefore, we try to find so-called proxies, indirect indicators, which are which has not a legal status, but somehow makes it more realistic that that guy, even if it, he or she has the position, a formal position of an entrepreneur, he has nothing to do with his property. You know, and therefore, for example, such things that how large share of uh, of his uh, 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 revenue of this enterprise is coming from uh, state orders, uh, or what is the share of export, uh, or, or how large share of the uh, uh, dividends uh, 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 taken out from how large share of the profit as dividends taken out from the enterprise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Or we try to set up such what we call uh, the moments of truth. You know, the moments of truth, we call it when it happened, for example, in the Hungarian media world, that on one day, uh, 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 close to 500, close to 500 media enterprises were given as a present to a, uh, uh, to a foundation, which had was appointed practically by the prime minister. It's it's very unusual in a, in a market economy that you voluntarily uh, give a present. The second such thing is what I would say, the, marriage, the, the divorces of marriages. According to the Hungarian law, if a, uh, uh, if a couple divorces, then half of the assets should be uh, given to the, to the wife or to the husband. Okay? What happened in Hungary in the case of oligarchs, when they divorced, then it happened, uh, 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 turned out that only a tiny share remained at the, at the wife because 99% uh, uh, of the assets belong to somebody else and not to the husband, you know, or uh, again, a moment of the true or death, you know, the, uh, 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 the inheritance, uh, uh, the heritage. Uh, when it came out, turned out that, for example, an oligarch, uh, a Hungarian famous film producer and, and uh, Andrew Wojna uh, died, then, uh, then it became clear that the casinos, which were on, on his name until that time, and the and the second biggest uh, uh, nationwide TV channel also, it does not belong to him because uh, uh, the widow uh, has no access to these assets after his death. You know, these are these shows indirectly that the former position does not mean anything in these societies. This is why we concentrated uh, concentrated on uh, on on. On these uh, these things, and maybe one final thing, uh, 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 yes, uh, with the peer review journals, uh, uh, we have to face the situation that that of course we challenge the mainstream approach of politology. Of course, it's a natural thing that in this in this case it's very difficult to get into these uh, these journals of representing mainly this mainstream ideology. And this is why we put a huge emphasis on that uh, we try to incorporate uh, uh, from the Eastern Bloc's uh, uh, researchers uh, and to give opportunity for them uh, to express their view and to uh, 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 and to have, for example, these uh, two volumes on the Ukrainian case uh, uh, on a 
on a coherent conceptual base and to try to use this conceptual framework for the description of different phenomena uh, uh, related to the to the uh, Russian aggression in Ukraine and its and its consequences. And now you 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 should yeah yes, definitely yes of Can I get the... yes yeah. try to show yeah. the just a second. Yeah. Until that, I would say that this triangle, this uh, this this three uh, D model, is an interactive one, and it has such a function that anybody can try to correct it to to find other trajectories for other countries and save it from the save it from the website. Yeah, yeah. I I will show this uh, just dynamic. Uh, yeah, yeah. So now. Yeah, now Balint, uh, Balint just covered the hard part, answering the questions. Yeah. I covered the easy part, the, the 3D model. So uh, the triangles that you just saw in the presentation as a two-dimensional thing, we have them here. Uh, this is on our website, postcommunistregimes.com, and anyone can access it in this kind of 3D model. And how this works? Well, we have the six regimes here, the two democracies, two autocracies, and two dictatorships. However, in this uh, model, in this 3D model, they are divided up by various dimensions. For example, here we have the mainstream typology, the mainstream typology of hybrid regimes, liberal democracy, electoral democracy, competitive authoritarianism, hegemonic authoritarianism, closed authoritarianism. We do not say these categories are meaningless. They, are, they have their own meaning if we are thinking only on the democracy dictatorship axis. However, they are overgeneralizing categories. They're overgeneralizing. If you say it is a competitive authoritarian system, the system can be closer to conservative autocracy, but it can be downward in the realm of patronal democracy, patronal autocracy as well. So we have to add another dimension, for example, patronalism. So if you put these two triangles in your mind on uh, on each other, on top of each other, and if you imagine that the competitive authoritarianism was somewhere here, then you can immediately see that the competitive authoritarian system can be non-patronal as well as informal patronal. And we added various other dimensions, like plurality of power networks, whether it was multi-pyramid power network or single pyramid. Uh, formality of institutions, of course, formal, semi-formal, informal. Then ruling parties members, whether they are politicians, whether they are caterers, or whether they are vessels, whether they are vessels, whether they are just executors of the will of, uh, of the party leader and uh, the leader of, of an informal network owning practically the party. Dominant economic mechanism, how the state works, or how they rather, what drives economic actors. Is it a competitive market? Is it a state-led market with what we call bureaucratic resource redistribution? Or is it a relational market driven by the rationales of informal patron client networks and by what we call relational market redistribution? Also, I could go to corruption, uh, the various forms, whether it is system destroying or system constituting. I can go to ideology, but already mentioned whether it is the system is ideology driven or ideology applying, and also autonomy of civil society. Now, if we put all these triangles on top of each other, and we put one single point in there, at any given point uh, in the triangle, they have to be at the same point, as if we put down a needle through all of these, and uh, the certain country it has to be in the same point in all the triangles. This is how we pinpoint a certain country in a certain point in time within the triangle. This is how this whole uh, thing works. Along these 11 dimensions, we can define in a complex way, if complexity was already mentioned, we wanted to give a complex definition. We wanted to give a model that is, uh, on the one hand, functional, but on the other hand, also can capture the complexity of the uh, of these regimes. And just to uh, show you, for example, uh, you can see the Ukrainian trajectory that I already showed you. Uh, here, of course, you can move it uh, completely. So this is this is how it this is how it looks. And immediately here, you can compare it to. Let me just remove the dates. With, for example, the Russian trajectory, you can immediately see when you put them on the same triangle how they moved. Uh, in different ways, and then you can, of course, look at them at the various dimensions as well. And with this tool, we think we can uh, 
uh, illustrate and we can show the trajectories of various regimes. And it is also a good way to compare them, to compare them and their own and their uh, development trajectories. And let me just show you two countries, one of them being Hungary and the Hungarian trajectory and uh, how, how it developed I, I, uh, and, also, and Poland and how Poland developed. Now, the point is that let me just do this. If I do this, what I did is that I went back to mainstream political science. I went back to the democracy dictatorship <laughs> access. And this is what you see there. And if you read uh, political science journals about comparing Orban and Kaczynski, this is what you will read. That, yeah, uh, though they are the black sheep of the world, Kaczynski was, the black sheep of the EU. Uh, Orban is, uh, they are both going towards dictatorship, towards autocracy. Yes, Orban is further along the way, but Kaczynski is also catching up. That was the mainstream narrative if you are thinking within the democracy dictatorship axis. However, when you expand this into a triangle, you can immediately see the qualitative difference between them and the huge uh, difference between a conservative autocracy and a patron autocracy. You can see the difference between a system where, in the case of Poland, there was an attempt to centralize power, but not an attempt to, uh, to concentrate and accumulate personal wealth. So Kaczynski was trying to build an autocracy. He wasn't trying to build a criminal system. Whereas Orban is, is building an autocracy and he's also building a mafia state, a criminal system. Yeah. And uh, this, is, this is where I think I... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Also, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can, I can, yes. Uh, about the Russian trajectory. Yes, that's, that's correct. So, um, uh, yeah, so what we see in the case of Russia is uh, that, uh, of course, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it goes into that kind of oligarchic anarchy, which Barnett mentioned, that is closest to the patronal democracy type because it is not centralized. There are multiple uh, autonom autonomous power centers, and all, but all of them are patronal, and patronalism is highly present. But then it is getting centralized uh, by Putin, in the hands of Putin. And then the whole system moves, moves downward to patronal autocracy. And what we saw during the war, or what we are seeing during the war, is a kind of movement now towards dictatorship. And uh, one of the main things, uh, one of the main dimensions where that can be, saw, can be, uh, can be seen <clears throat> is change in the dimension of uh, formality and informality. So how the system, uh, how the formal elements of the system are getting stronger, and the informal elements weaker. How the formal elements, like the like the rule of the of the ex KGB people, the Siloviki, how the uh, the military structures themselves are getting stronger, and the oligarchic structures are getting weaker, and uh, the oligarchs' influence uh, uh, getting weaker uh, uh, in the case of in the case of Russia. So within this triangle, uh, which we created for the 2020 book, we uh, already could uh, use it to model the trajectory of Russia even forward. And uh, we think that uh, uh, when we, we actually selected 12 countries. So there are 12 countries that we selected. In our books, this is explained why, because they represent different trajectories and they all uh, represent one, one uh, certain type of trajectory. But what, is, uh, can, be, what can be done in this, uh, in this model, that if anyone disagrees with us, they can just say that, oh, no, Russia doesn't is not going that way, but perhaps this way or this way or some other way. So you can just draw into this and you can save what you've done. So this is really just a so this is really just a way uh, to to because we also intended this not just as a research tool but also an education tool. So we really uh, are trying to, and this is why it's on our website. This is why most of our books are open access because we really want to spread these views and we want to make them usable uh, in the form of books, in the form of 3D models, in the form of presentations and in various languages uh, so that uh, students and universities uh, can learn about these, not, uh, if not from peer reviewed journals, then from, uh, from our website and from uh, along these, uh, by these means. Yeah, and uh, I think that's, that's it, thank you.
I give it to you. I'll take that one as well. Okay, so C students, you know where to go. Um, <laughs> and we've just got a little bit of time left. And so we will take uh, Q&A, questions from the audience, comments. Because we've got limited time, if you could keep them really brief, and I shall bring the mic over to you um, just to speed things up. So, should... Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Benny. Um, I have, so I'm also researching kind of Fidesz and their hist ideological history. Um, and back in the nineties, essentially a lot of Fidesz intellectuals and politicians were making a lot of the same points that you're making today. I mean, their argument was that there was this, uh, not post-mafia, but I mean, not mafia state, but there were these congealed structures. There's this, um, the communist elite had remained in power uh, after the transition in 1990 um, and were operating this extra political apparatus. Um, so my question is, how much of that is true? Um, I mean, in the 90s, where how did Hungary start off? Uh, is Fidesz not a reaction to something legitimate we'll take questions in threes andy i think you had a question did you not uh, well aliona asked me to ask something about ukraine um precisely because there's this whole new conceptual structure here and vocabulary and um uh, grammar as henry said uh you could start in all sorts of places but just on the political narrative um which i guess is the basis of most things um, so you have two attempts at autocratization in Ukraine. Uh, so I think the Yanukovych period, 2010 to 14, uh, you know, it kind of was, I mean, what Aliona said about whether pyramid is the right metaphor, it, it looks like an attempt to create a single pyramid, more or less, um, albeit with considerable autonomy still for the mature oligarchical groups by then. But the Kushma period, I think, is more complicated. Uh, I mean, Kushma says in his book, not Ukraine is not Russia, but his, his political diary, basically. He's quite candid. He says, well, well, OK, we had an oligarchy, but at least it was Ukrainian, not Russian. And he says, I kept the balance after. And it's interesting that you have uh, 97 as a turning point. Because... Uh, 97, 98, you have this bare knuckle fight between Lazarenko and uh, Kushma, right? Winner takes all. Kushma wins. And after that, he emphasizes balance. So you're going, in some ways, from a struggle over who controls a potential single pyramid into, you know, this multi period system, multi pyramid system in his later years. Um, uh, so I'm not quoting his own claims as the verbatim truth, <laughs> but uh, you can see his second term, because the oligarchy is actually created in his first term. And then after this fight with Lazarenko, it settles down into more of a balanced system. Um, unless your argument is that it is someone else who's unbalancing it, which is the Donetsk people in, in the later Kushmir years. Let's take one more question. Um, who would like to... Ideally, I'd like to take one from a female audience member so we don't have the Q&A equivalent of a manal. So, anyone? Okay, let's answer those two then. Um, <clears throat> yes, just uh, just starting with, uh, uh, with your question that uh, what happened with the communist elite after the regime change. Uh, Ivan Seleny uh, uh, wrote an article, an investigation around 93 or 94, uh, uh, in which paper he, uh, he investigated three countries, Hungary, Poland, Poland and Russia, uh, and, uh, and they searched that a uh, hard share of the previous nomenclatura belonged to the ruling elite after the regime change. In Russia, the number was, the percentage was about 80%, around 80%, the new elite, belong to the former nomenclatura as well. In Poland, it was around 50%. In Hungary, it was 26%. So, so, so it's just an ideological statement. And those who are saying this, you know, even the father of Viktor Orban 
was the party secretary of the of a stone mine, you know, stone mine decorated with uh, 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 prizes uh, 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 by the communist government because of his good work. And now uh, a large share of, uh, of uh, public money is directed into that uh, mine and, his, and to his family. So these are cover ideologies just telling about everything that they were communists, you know. For example, the whole anti-communist dissident movement in the terminology of Orban, they are former communists who are what is what is uh, what is not that uh, uh, not the truth and it leads to another problem as well that what can you do with the with this uh, ideological panels what they use and when <clears throat> we are thinking that it's uh, the mainstream literature analyzes is that uh, that it's a christian government because it refers a lot to, to God and the Christianity, it's a, maybe an ethno-nationalist one because uh, because he refers to the nation and the third is that it's a family protecting because uh, God, nation, family, these are the major slogans. It has different functions there. So these are, it's not an ideology-driven regime, it's an ideology-applying regime. The God, the God and referring to God and Christianity has a function to withdraw all question of this uh, of of the possible uh, disputing that question when for example orban when opened one of these uh, uh, football stadiums uh, in hungary newly built football stadiums and and told that thanks god that the stadium is here that the function of it was that you could not raise the question whether it was needed to build a football stadium on the money of the taxpayers while if it was the present of the god you know gift of the god then of course you cannot this uh, uh, have a discourse about it or uh, concerning ethno-nationalism he is just a uh, uh, as I mentioned before, he's in a very good relation with autocratic nationalist leaders of, of neighboring countries, uh, which would uh, uh, contradict to this thing on the surface. But it's not a, con not a contradiction because his nationalism is not directed against Slovaks, Romanians, or Serbs. His nationalism is, uh, is targeted against uh, those Hungarians who do not belong to his patron client network. In his eyes, me, who is not a Hungarian, and he fights us and not Slovaks in general or Romanians in general. So this is this ethno-nationalistic thing has no sense at all. He is not nationalist in this sense. He is just an autocrat who fights against his uh, his his rivals within the, uh, within the country. And it is the same with his family, with uh, his his uh, uh, his. Uh, anti-gender uh, waves and all these things when he's uh, arguing in favor of traditionalist families you know uh, practically uh, he defends those uh, those patterns of patriarchic rule what you can witness in a family in a traditional family and the same pattern is used when he disposes over the whole country uh, so sociologically anthropologically these are homogeneous homo homological type of uh, homologue types of, of of exercising rule now concerning this uh, question with Yanukovych and the, and the, uh, and the different uh, regions uh, uh, ruled by different uh, uh, different oligarchs of course uh, in ukraine as a huge country with a lot of uh, 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 divisions not regional divisions and divisions their relations to the to russia as well etc etc of course uh, it was much more difficult to centralize into one single uh, single pyramid uh, to bring these uh, patrol networks and even uh, uh, these regional patronal networks were to some extent regionally centralized because they were even themselves a kind of coalition of patron client networks in Donetsk and Dnepropetrovsk and 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 and, and other parts under other parts of the country by but but roughly if if you want to say roughly the aim was somehow to to build a single pyramid single pyramid network of course it has another side whether you would uh, belong to the Russian world or to the Western world, and of course it helped to divide and to fight uh, and to find popular uh, support for for fighting these attempts of Yanukovych. Can I make just some very short yes, comments? Yes. Yeah, just very very short comments. Uh, first on the uh, on the Hungarian ideology and uh, this. Uh, uh, because Barrett already answered uh, about the fate of the old nomenclatura, I would just like to add that uh, actually this argument 
that the privatization process was unjust. And this is actually an argument that's present all over the post-communist world. And very often this is just used as an ideological instrument, an ideological instrument to legitimize the change of the ownership structure. So this is mainly a tool in the hand of a chief patron, a chief patron to legitimize his attempts of taking away property from some people and giving it to their own. Because he can always say that the present structure of ownership is unjust because of the past. So this is like a complete detachment of diagnosis and therapy. There is a diagnosis saying that uh, things have to be changed because they are unjust, but he decides what the therapy should be. And that is, of course, another unjust structure. But anyway, it is an instrument in his hand, uh, in the hand of the chief patron to legitimize his attempts to change the ownership structure. About the uh, Yanukovych, also this argument that uh, you mentioned that, uh, uh, okay, it's oligarchic, but at least it's not Russian oligarchs uh, that they create. Uh, well, this is uh, also, uh, it was echoed uh, in Hungary as well, when they say that uh, it was said in a parliament that, uh, yeah, maybe the monies are stolen or rather the monies are given to Hungarian oligarchs, but at least they are not Western multinationals. So. This is once again an ideological instrument to support your own uh, adopted political family, as we call this in informal patron networks. And finally, just a quick comment uh, on the on the on the trajectories that you see now here, uh, the trajectory of Ukraine. Of course, the, these are uh, drawn with a broad brush. So we did not try to uh, make uh, uh, we did not create a single point for every minute change and every single uh, 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 like, I don't know, like a year to year kind of uh, 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 analysis to this. So for example, in the case of Hungary, there was a revolution of 1956. It doesn't get an, an own point in this, uh, in this uh, uh, trajectory. Maybe it should, but we just uh, wanted to give a general idea about the main turning points in terms of these features, in terms of these regime specific features as we call them because we wanted to show how along these features the con and therefore between these six regime types the regimes are moving and how they are moving away from communist dictatorship and how they are following different paths going towards various forms of democracy and various forms of autocracy yep more or less running out of time i where we have an online audience do we have any interesting online questions one question, hmm? yeah. one question. One question. yeah so the question is um yeah. arms relationships still play an important role in centralized personal regimes like russia you um, just say that again can hang do clans relationships still play an important role in centralized paternal regimes like russia just very briefly, uh, what already Balint mentioned, that uh, that uh, there was, uh, of course, uh, when we are speaking about the different patron client networks who are in an autocratic regimes, these clans has different type, can have different type of nucleuses on which it is based. It's, it's, uh, it's understandable when the clan state was used first, they referred to Central Asian countries, uh, Central Asian post-Soviet republics, where the nucleus of these clans were at, had ethnic bases. But of course, in the case of Russia, it had a middle level KGB base and and, and those in uh, uh, in St. Petersburg uh, uh, regional administration. And this was, in the case of Hungary, uh, the base of this clan is was the fraternity house where uh, Orban Viktor and his uh, uh, classmates in the in, in the universities, they were uh, grown up, you know, and this is, and therefore it can, in the case of Russia, of course, and while in Hungary, uh, such a way, this ethnic base uh, was not much to do with the former secret services, with the former Communist Party, with the former Communist Party, it was a brand new, I would say, clan, clan structure. Uh, 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 therefore, uh, now most of the oligarchs around them, they are, uh, they are patron uh, uh, bred oligarchs, newly formed oligarchs, not just adopted ones. The rivals practically were suppressed and, and, and dismissed somehow. In the case of Russia, it had 
two major pillars, and this is what the Russian literature reflects: the Siloviki and the so-called liberals, and the, and 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 the oligarchs. There was a and it had a, there was a <clears throat> delicate balance between the two all the time, uh, with this uh, uh, one pillar based on the FSB, secret service, national guard, army, etc. Uh, uh, the successors of the KGB and the Soviet uh, army, and on the on the other hand, the oligarchs, a huge share of them uh, were new and not directly tied originally uh, to these uh, secret service structures. But now with the uh, with the war uh, against uh, Ukraine, aggression against Ukraine, uh, uh, these oligarchs uh, uh, fall in a trap because uh, 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 they, st they used to uh, save their properties and fortunes uh, in Western countries. But now, because of the sanctions, they, uh, it's not a safe place anymore. Uh, and at the same time, Putin wants them to come back. But if they come back, you know, they have a bad habit that they fall out of the windows several times, you know, and uh, and they cannot control uh, all the circumstances which should avoid uh, this type of development. So therefore, the uh, the role of the oligarchs itself and the and the weight in the power is diminished. Uh, um, extremely in the Russian structure, and such a way uh, through the way of Siloviki, and that that uh, that uh, those which uh, Nikolai Petrov describes as state oligarchs, those guys who has no property themselves, but they are at the top of state enterprises at the same time with very huge revenues, very huge revenues. Uh, they are not uh, uh, such positions uh, where you can inherit uh, your property. Such a way, these formal organizations as the nucleus of this clan now gained a, a, a more important role than before. And such a way we described it, that it goes towards the way, towards the dictatorship. And what is very interesting that from an uh, ideology applying regime, now Maria uh, uh, Snagovaya with two other uh, uh, fellows, they wrote a very interesting article how this uh, uh, mixed type of ideology of Putin now goes towards a more coherent type of ideology based on the uh, imperial uh, imperial uh, uh, nationalist uh, 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 nationalist score, it's, and and that this is why it's going to that direction. So it was a probe of our model as well whether uh, uh, these brand new developments can be this uh, described or explained within this model or not. But we think that maybe yes. That's it. Thank you. Almost out of time, so I'm going to give the last word to our three um, discussant stroke um, panelists. So very briefly, if I could ask uh, Henry, Aliona and uh, Cheryl, if they would like to give us one key takeaway, one key lesson, one thing that um, that might have that policymakers and political actors might like to bear in mind. And um, Henry, I'm sorry, you were displaced by a diagram. You've now appeared on our screen. <laughs> would you like, can I turn to you and ask you very briefly if you'd like to sort of uh, address that? Yeah, I mean, I guess there, there's a lot to say, but uh, in the interest of time being very brief, um, I mean, to me, I think it's that we have to be uh, careful not to adopt overly simplistic interpretations of, uh, you know, what corruption means for a country like Ukraine and think that it's somehow, um, you know, endemic and therefore that, uh, you know, the money spent there is not going to be used somehow to purpose. Um, you know, I think what we've seen in the in the war so far is that uh, you know despite all the the corruption that we've had um you know it's it's not like a corruption that's value free and um it's more just a, a what we're looking at is more patronal politics and in, in, in a way that ukrainians are working to get things done and um the war itself is providing it also with a opportunity to uh change this uh equilibrium kind of social situation um, and so I, I think in this particular context, we need to be uh, careful not to let the uh, kind of fears of corruption somehow minimize uh, the need to support or, or give us even pause for the need to support uh, Ukraine against um, uh, Russia in this invasion. Great, thanks. Um, Aliana or Cheryl? Well, I just... Uh, would say um, the small one. Um, yes, I would just say that um, every event should finish with so what question, and um, 
I, I just leave it unanswered, but I hope, you know, it will be something about exit. You know, we somehow need um, to think beyond the typology, beyond the triangle and think, where do we go from here? And how, how do we drop that kind of democracy with adjectives or, you know, new terminology with adjectives um, that actually, you know, transform and take us away from the question what works and how to transform it. And that would uh, be my sort of takeaway or homework, rather, <laughs> homework. Cheryl, did you no. OK, so yes, so what? The best question in social science. Well, on that point, because we're over time, I'll wind up uh, the event. We'll finish off. Um, I just want to thank our um, the Balint and Balint, um, Cheryl, Aliona and Henry for joining us um, remotely. I'm sorry we, we couldn't get you over here in person, but but you know we'll try some other time. I um, can also thank our student volunteers who've helped out and our uh, communication and events team who've helped make this happen. Hybrid event isn't straightforward. And I'd like to thank you, uh, the audience and the online audience. Sorry we couldn't take all your questions. And could I could just ask you if you could leave the room quickly because there's another event, a Macedonian film, uh, which is going to be set up very shortly. So thanks, everybody. <laughs>